This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hello, ASV. Not too bad, right? It's time for This Week in Virology. This is episode 346. Today is July 14th, 2015. Hello, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We are coming to you today from Western University, which is in London, Ontario. And we're at the 34th annual meeting of the American Society for Virology, ASV. And the part of the TWIV crew is here. We have a great audience. And joining me today, normally from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> How's everything, Kathy? You enjoying this meeting? This meeting's been great. All kinds of purple everywhere, lots of virology. What could be better? Wonderful. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. You're enjoying the meeting. I am enjoying the meeting. This is always a fabulous meeting, and this, uh, this year is no exception. All right. Really great. And our special guest today from Yale University, Joan Stites. Welcome to TWIV. Hello. <laughs> And we're going to talk all about you and your career and your science. But there is one thing we need to do first, and that is, that's the weather here. How's it been? It's been nice up until this morning, right? And right now it's 22 Celsius, and I'm in front of an audience that appreciates Celsius. Not like, not like these guys who want Fahrenheit. Right? I can do the conversion. You can you know, do it. 22 C, it's cloudy. It was raining this morning. Um, maybe it's raining now. I'm not sure. But we had a great week. But hopefully there'll be no thunderstorms tonight for the banquet, so the, the band will continue to play. I have to tell you, I looked it up, and it is 91 in Gainesville. That's 33 Celsius. We don't so care. We I'm don't happy care. I'm here. You don't care? <laughs> yeah. Don't care what it is in Gainesville. Uh, I just want to say that um, it's been my pleasure to be president of ASV for the past year, and I arranged the morning symposia. I hope you like them. Yes, like them? yes, fabulous. And. If I hadn't been doing TWIV, well, I wouldn't have been elected president to begin with, but I wouldn't have the breadth of virology knowledge that I needed to put together such a broad uh, program. So it's because we do different papers every week, we try and do different viruses. I've been exposed to a lot of the people who spoke, I know, through TWIV. And so, thank you, TWIV. <laughs> it's been really great. Now, another important thing. On July 1st, Rich Condit retired. And uh, 37 years in virology? Uh, if you count, if you start from when I first got my first assistant professor uh, appointment, yes, 37 years. And he shut down his lab, Gone. shut down his office, took Gone. everything home. You're going to still do TWIV, right? Uh, I will do TWIV for as long as you will have me, Vincent, okay? <laughs> And uh, it feels like I decided the other day that I'm not really retired. I'm just gone freelance. Okay. okay. So I'm a freelance virologist. It's a new career. So the first thing you did after retiring was go to ASV. That's correct. <laughs> that works. And you drove here from Florida, right? Uh, drove to, it's complicated. Drove to Boston. My wife's on her way from Boston to pick me up here, and we're going to continue on to Seattle. We're on a two-month circumnavigation of the... Right. US. So if you don't hear Rich on TWIV for the next two months, it that's may be I, in, yeah. It may be intermittent, but I will tune in. I brought my headset with me. Okay. okay. Now, uh, many of you may know that Rich was a PhD student in Joan's lab. All right. So here we have Joan going my strong. My very first student who first student. dared walk into the laboratory. It was very exciting. And I now have goosebumps. 
This is, this, yeah, literally, Kathy can see him. This is <laughs> really spooky and really amazing. Are you going to cry? <laughs> yeah. You might cry? I might cry. I right, get this. I get this. <laughs> so Joan is going strong. Amazing work, which we heard the other night. And Rich is finished. What do you think about that, Joan? <laughs> I admire his courage yeah. <laughs> to say, it's time, and this is what I want to do. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you've always operated at several quantum levels above me, so go for it, you know, keep going. Not forever. No? Not, someday not forever. you'll stop, you think? Absolutely, yes. Voluntarily? Yes. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about you. You're, you're our guest on TWIV. It's you and no one else. We have an hour to talk about you and, and your science. I want to go way back. And, uh, you know, I, I developed the introduction for your keynote the other night. And I learned which a lot was about fabulous, it. which Thank was you. really, really good. Thank, Thank you. you. And um, I wanted to start with your interest in science. I remember you told me your dad encouraged you to be a scientist, but uh -huh. he wasn't a scientist, right? Yeah. Do you know yeah. where that came from? Well, I think his, his mother also was very interested in science. And I think that's partially where it came from. I, it, it, this isn't to say that my mother also wasn't very encouraging, but I think uh, fathers are very, very important, particularly for women scientists. And I found that in talking to a lot of women who've gone into science, that the encouragement from their father really, mm -hmm. really helped. And Kathy's nodding her head. Yes, I agree. Your father did too? Yeah. 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 He's a so scientist. When did this yeah. start? In middle school, high school? Mm, very even scary. younger than that. Yeah. He always encouraged me to collect things, rocks and butterflies and insects and, you know, all those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Was there anything, anyone else in particular that sparked your interest? Well, I went to a girls' school. I grew up in Minneapolis. And I had some fabulous science teachers there. Uh, I remember my physics teacher. I remember my biology teacher. She also taught chemistry in particular. And I mentioned this to you the other day, but let me mention it again. The National Academy of Sciences has just announced that the next president will be the first woman. Her name is Marsha McNutt. She's a geophysicist with an incredible record. She's currently the editor of Science Magazine. But what's special about Marsha is she went to the same school I went to. Ooh. I was a decade older than her, so I didn't know her at the time, but I've run into her since. And it turns out that Mrs. Hill, our physics teacher, was particularly inspiring for us both. So during uh, college, which was at Antioch, Antioch yeah. right, you had the opportunity to work with Alex Rich. Yeah. How did that come about? OK. So, as some of you might know, Antioch College, which is in Ohio, has a work-study program. And it's had this since the 1920s, where it takes a year longer to get through your bachelor's degree. But meanwhile, you basically spend half your time on campus doing courses and half your time off doing a job someplace else. And it turns out that there had been a job that had been started not by me, but by previous people in Alex Rich's lab at MIT. And for those of you who don't know, Alex Rich unfortunately died at the age of 90 just this past spring. But he was one of that very core group of initial molecular biologists in the US who got you know everything sort of started. And at the time that I went to his lab, you mentioned this in your introduction, uh, the DNA structure was still so new that it hadn't made it into textbooks or into courses. And when I got to MIT to this job, I learned about DNA and I was just completely enthralled. I was just wowed because I'd been sort of interested in genetics as a high school student, but it was all very black box. What was a molecular basis? And I've always liked molecules. And here all of a sudden was this beautiful double-stranded structure and it was clear how it replicated and how genes were passed on from generation to generation. And I remember being just totally turned on by the whole idea and very, very excited. Did you do experiments during that time? I did do experiments. I did experiments on ribosomes. 
So my first real introduction to experimental work was on RNA. And as you may have noticed, I've never veered from RNA and a passion for RNA in my entire career. I appreciate that. That's great, right? Yeah. So Actually, it was interesting what I was doing. Many of you will appreciate this. It had been learned at that point that if you heated up DNA, it came apart. Mm -hmm. And then if you cooled it back down slowly, it went back together. And it was known that ribosomes had RNA in them. So people thought, well, maybe if you heated up the ribosomes, they would denature, which of course they did. The optical density went up because the DNA was, or sorry, the RNA was, was unfolding to some extent and also probably getting degraded. So I spent weeks standing in front of a Beckman DU spectrophotometer, heating up ribosome solutions and then cooling them down. And of course, the OD never came back down <laughs> because by that time, the ribosome was trashed. And that experiment just doesn't work with ribosomes directly. A Beckman DU. Who knows what that is? Yeah, not many. All right? the gray-haired people. Yeah, right? yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Wow, <clears throat> that's yeah. incredible. Where were the ribosomes from? They're prokaryotic. Yeah, they were from E. coli. E. coli. Yeah. So, did people come through Alex Rich's lab? Did you meet anyone? Well, I did meet Jim Watson, whose graduate student I later became, and um, let's see, David Baltimore was at that time a postdoc, I think, with Jim Darnell. So there were interesting things going on in the department. When they came through, would they talk to you or? You know? Yeah, well, there would be parties and everybody would get together. I remember that at MIT Building 16, which was the main biology building, um, they put a new floor on and expanded. And there was a housewarming party for the floor. And what was served at the housewarming party was champagne and fried chick embryos, which are really quite delicious. <laughs> Hopefully they weren't influenza virus infected. Well, that was probably what they were going to be the next day yeah. if they hadn't been rescued and put into the deep fryer. Wow. wow. <laughs> OK, it's another era, right? Yep. Um, so this was in what year of your college? Was it later? That was the. So I was actually in college for five years, and that was my third year in college. And then my fourth year, I went to Germany on a study abroad plan, also worked in a lab, and took some courses at Tübingen in Germany. So despite this, you applied to medical school, right? I did. Why is that? Well, because I'd been in four or five different labs. At the time, I had to decide what to do next. Um, I knew I was interested in science and biology, but when I looked around, I'd never seen a head of a woman, or a woman head of lab, or a woman professor in the sciences. And so I just, I didn't even think about it. I just assumed that was impossible. And I did know some women physicians, so I decided I'd better go to medical school. Hmm. Were there other women in the labs that you worked in? Oh yeah, there were a lot of women, but they were all research associates or technicians or... Right. Yeah. Okay. So lack of role models. Lack of role models. Then you, but you did not go to medical school. I did not go to medical school because the summer before I was about to go to medical school, I wanted, I wanted to be home in Minneapolis and spend some time with my parents. And I got a job at the University of Minnesota. You mentioned this with Joseph Gall, who's a very famous cell biologist. How many of you know who invented in situ hybridization? <laughs> Joe Gall. Uh, he also was the first person to ever observe the octagonal structure of the nuclear pore complex. So he's done a lot of really famous things in cell biology. And he's still an active scientist. He currently works at the Carnegie Institution in Baltimore. And um, he was in the process of, he'd been an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. He was in the process of moving to Yale, where he spent a large part of his academic career. And he was packing his boxes, so he sort of gave me a project and said, do this, and then, you know, was off moving. And by the 1st of August, I said, you know, this is so much fun. This is what I want to do. I don't really want to go to medical school. I want to continue doing research, and I don't care what my prospects are. 
And actually, because I'd met Jim Watson when I'd been at MIT, I was able to write to him and say, you know, could I possibly switch to the graduate program instead? And that was how it happened after August 1st. And you, in September, and I did. you went into the in graduate In September, program. I went into the graduate program. They'd had somebody else who had dropped out at the last minute So these are the days program. when you had to write letters, right? Not email. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. You could make long distance telephone calls, but they were very expensive. So you wrote him a letter, a postal yeah. letter, and he answered that. Right, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, that, so that's, that's a huge decision. Was that scary? No. No, because you knew no, this I, was No, I, I knew. I okay. knew that that was what I wanted to do, yeah. Yeah. All right, so you joined, the, this is the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology program. Yeah, right? yeah, which wasn't yet a department at Harvard. It was a program for, um, the faculty was some were from chemistry and some were from biology because this was such a new field. You know, it was, it was brand new. And uh, what was remarkable about it was, you know, that was a time when you sort of knew all the labs in the world who were doing molecular biology and everybody was in constant communication with each other. There used to be uh, something called the IEG, Information Exchange Group. And people sent around paper by, by snail mail, of course, preprints of papers because it took, you know, six months to get something published and everybody wanted everybody else to know what they just discovered before it was actually published. And you sent out your preprints before they were accepted, right? Oh, yeah. Just sent oh, them right yeah. out, right? Oh, you sent them right out, right? right? Absolutely. And had Watson won his Nobel at this point? He, well, he won it the year before I got to Harvard. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he had um, been at Harvard for a while, right? Well seven years or eight years or something like that. So when you arrived in his lab, there were other PhD students oh, yeah. already. Oh, yeah. Right? I was his 12th graduate student. But the first female student. The, but the correct? first female student, which I didn't actually know at the time he said yes to me. I was, uh, it was only later that I knew that he'd never had a woman hmm. graduate student. Was that because no one asked or he, you don't know? I, I don't really know. Hmm. So uh, when you went in the lab, did he tell you what to work on, or did you say, I want to do this? No, no. It was very, um, very sort of freelance. People found their own projects. I mean, there were certain things going on in the lab. One was a study of ribosomes. And um, at the time that I entered the lab, it was thought that ribosomes were like viruses that the RNA was on the inside and then there was some sort of protein on the outside and it wasn't, in, as, as a matter of fact, until the middle of my graduate career that it was discovered both by people in Watson's lab and people in Geneva that ribosomes actually had a bunch of different proteins in them and that these weren't, you know, coding, coding the RNA being on the inside. Um, so that was being worked on. The beginnings of protein synthesis were being worked on. What happened during initiation, the fact that FMAT tRNA was involved, uh, what the termination factors were, what was um, involved in the suppression of nonsense mutations. And the other thing in the lab that was being used as a tool was RNA phage. So I started out, actually, as a virologist. Um, and so I worked on something called R17, uh, which is an RNA phage like MS2. You all know about MS2, the hairpin loop, and the coat protein. Well, R17 is virtually the same virus, but so not quite. So do this for the Caleb's in the audience. Positive sense, single-stranded RNA, three genes, right? Three genes. A well, there's a fourth gene that's overlapping. Oh. This that is... got discovered later. OK. At uh, any rate. Uh, so A, coat and replicase, maturation protein, coat protein, replicase, subunit, cop stuff from the cells all wrapped in a protein coat. Gosh, you learn stuff as a graduate student. Uh, you know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't forget these things. So he was okay with you working on that, right, Watson? Well, okay, so um, I sort of tried various projects that were sort of floating around the lab, and then finally I ended up on the one that I ended up on, which was on the on R17, and this minor protein, the A protein, which is necessary in the capsid in order for the phage to attach to the uh, F pili. So these are pili that are only on male bacteria, and it's now known that they sort of retract, and that carries in the RNA, and that initiates the infection. So what aspect of that protein were you looking at? Well, I was just characterizing it and looking at what happened 
And there was another graduate student in the lab that had made nonsense mutations in the three genes. And uh, he was characterizing, or I ended up characterizing what happened if you didn't have A protein. And what you got was defective particles. So you got the RNA got replicated because the synthetase was there. The coat protein got made. But you didn't form the particles correctly without this minor protein. So you who, did. who else was in the lab when you were there? Ah, OK. Mario Capecchi. Anybody know him? <laughs> Come on, you know Mario Capecchi. Uh, and he was working on um, translation or suppression of nonsense mutations right. in translation. People were just getting in vitro systems going to make proteins in vitro. And there was lots of exchange between our lab and a lab at uh, the Rockefeller run by Norton Zinder, who was also working on RNA phages and a lot of these very fundamental uh, things. And uh, a guy named Ray Jesslund. Um, yep, yep. Who else? Um, well, there were That's other good people enough. in That's the lab. Good. But, but let, me, let me tell you one thing. There, so there was a graduate student of mine uh, by the name of Dick Roblin. And he wrote his entire thesis on the sequence of one nucleotide. <laughs> um, and when you think of that compared to having the sequence of the human genome. So he determined we had this phage RNA. We didn't know what was at the two ends. And he figured out that the five prime end was PPPGP. And that was his entire thesis, because <laughs> it took a lot of work to figure that out at that time. So at what point did you say, I made the right decision? Oh, I think I did right away. Right away. I really liked it, yeah. Okay. yeah. And I noticed, looking back at your papers from that era, that Jim is, on, is not a co-author on any yeah. of them. Yeah. So I mean, this was an era in which this you know, small group of people who had come from other fields, because molecular biology didn't exist as a field. They come from physics or chemistry or some virologists, some biologists, but more from these sort of more esoteric sciences. And they all figured that you know, if you didn't start simple, you'd never be able to figure out the molecular basis of life. So as you all know, everybody worked on bacteria and bacteriophages because you know, it was just fervently believed that, I, I remember pe people even used to make derogatory comments about other labs that were trying to study mammalian cells and about how silly they were because these cells were so complicated nobody would ever understand what was going on inside them. And therefore you had to, you know, work on these very purest systems. I've already forgotten what your initial question uh, was, and I went you, off on this sole, tangent. You were the sole author on the paper. Oh, OK. So it was also an era. Jim had won his Nobel Prize. He was interested you know, in scientific answers. He was interested in education. And as many of you know, very shortly thereafter, he went and became the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Lab, which has meetings and is very involved in science education. He's written textbooks and so on. And you know, he didn't need to be an author on papers. Uh, as long as he could say, my lab has done this, 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 and this, he didn't need to be an author in order to get a grant. So um, he didn't put his name on the papers. And you have continued that tradition. Well, I continued it for a while. I confess that um, so much of the tide has turned in the other direction that uh, it's become, um, how shall I say, difficult to continue that. Well, I was the beneficiary of that uh, tradition, I must yes, say. And I'm yes. very grateful for it. It's great. So how yeah. was it to work with Jim Watson? Yeah. Well. <laughs> If, if any, how many of you have read one of his books? Yeah, oh, a lot of people have, OK. So he certainly comes across as a misogynist. But that's not really true. Um, Jim, when it comes to other scientists, he evaluates people on the basis of what he thinks they can do for science, what they can contribute. And it really doesn't matter, you know, what sex they are, what color they are, what size they are. If he thinks that they're a good scientist, then, then they're OK. Um, his views about the rest of the population may be a little bit more, how should we say, esoteric. Uh, <laughs> certainly an eccentric. Uh, but 
Did you? It was, and it was, it was a great place to be because Jim would go off and talk to people in other labs, and he'd come back with all sorts of news about, you know, so and so had just gotten this hint that this was being translated in vitro, and people would gather around in the hall and get all excited about the news he brought back. I mean, it was, it was really a wonderful place to so be a graduate great, you student. You had a great experience. Oh, yeah. Lab. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yep. So then you went to do a postdoc with Francis Crick. Now, how did you decide to do that? Well, okay. So the reason we went to Cambridge, England was because it was the world mecca of X-ray crystallography, which was my husband's um, field, not mine. So I went where my husband was going because uh, I'd gotten married. And so we went there because it was fabulous in X-ray crystallography. And um, Jim told me that you know, he'd written a letter to Francis saying that you, know, you should probably take her. And so actually, <laughs> I, I arrived in, in Cambridge and um, talked to Francis. And he said, you know, the lab's really very crowded. Can't you think of a project to do in the li a theoretical project to do in the library? <laughs> and I already knew that you know theory was not my forte. Uh, I was good at experiments at that time, and so um, what that meant was that what I did was I went around and I. The, the, the lab was set up in a very loose way. It wasn't really sort of groups with heads. It was divisions that were big divisions with like 30, 40 uh, researchers in them that had various uh, other people. I mean, Fred Sanger and Cesar Milstein were running one program, Max, Max Perutz and Aaron Klug and you know other fabulous Nobel Prize winners were running the structural biology, and then Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner were running the, quote, cell biology program. But there were a lot of staff members who were sort of senior scientists who'd been at the lab for a while and had come back from postdocs various places. And so I just sort of went around and I talked to everybody and said, you know, do you have a little bit of bench space next to where you are? And uh, what projects do you think might be exciting? And actually, the way, the way I ended up doing what I ended up doing, which was really, really good. Um, OK, so that, that, that project was, at that time, we didn't know how a prokaryotic ribosome knows where to start translating a messenger RNA. It was sort of thought, because some sequences were known, that there probably weren't AUGs right at the five prime end of all messages. That had been an earlier theory. But that, so then the question was, how, how would ribosomes know where to start? And this project had sort of been floating around the lab. And it turns out that it had been turned down by a number of my peers, who were all male postdocs coming in. And they looked at this project and said, ooh, that's pretty difficult. And in that day and age, postdocs were only two years long. And they thought, oh, I don't think I'm going to have anything to talk about in two years when I'm going to go back to the States and look for a job. And I better not do it. But I had no expectations of ever having a job. So it sounded pretty, <laughs> sounded pretty interesting to me. So I said, well, why don't I try this? That's great. So and then you, it turned out, after a struggle, it turned out working. It worked. Yeah. Within two years, you, you finished that? Um, actually, we were, there, we were there for three years. But actually, by the end of my second year, I had the initial results and was able to present them at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting on uh, protein synthesis. Could you briefly describe this experiment? Because it's one of the most important experiments in the known universe. <laughs> well, <laughs> why don't you say what you call it? Uh, what? Bind, bind and chew? Uh, bind and chew. I, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's Wasn't a binding it? protection experiment. Yeah, bind and yeah, chew. yeah, okay. So, so what was known before I started this is there had been some experiments done with synthetic messages. Remember, synthetic messages were what people used to solve the code. And people, 
people had taken um, poly A and bound ribosomes to it and then used ribonuclease to chew off the ends of the RNA and looked at how big a fragment was protected by the binding of ribosomes. So the idea was simply to do this on a real messenger RNA, namely the RNA from the phage that I'd been working on, R17, uh, which was all labeled with P32. Uh, back in those days, we didn't have rapid indirect sequencing methods. And then you get these protected P32 labeled fragments. And Fred Sanger, by that time, had worked out a way of fingerprinting and sequencing relatively small stretches of RNA long before he did DNA. And so I used those methods to um, then figure out what the sequence of these ribosome binding sites were. Um, and you know, if you think about it, everybody now knows what ribosome profiling is. So this was ribosome profiling on the single molecule level, because it was just R17 RNA, one molecule. So uh, labeling this, you must have uh, bacteria that you infect and throw in a whole slug of P32, of course, right? Of course, And yeah. then purify the phage, yeah. slogging through this right, stuff, right. bind the ribosomes, chew it up, isolate those on sucrose gradients, right. and, then, and then it's a race against time because the P32 is decaying. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And you must have worked closely with uh, Sanger's lab to do yes, this? Yes, yes. Right? Sanger's lab was the one that had developed the technology. Right. And they were working on 5S RNA, and they did very lots of tRNA structures were done, uh, suppressor tRNAs in addition to wild-type tRNAs, figuring out that whole story about how genetic suppression works. So, And you knew what the end termini were of these proteins, right? So, right, so right, this right. was... And, 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 and this was the f really the first demonstration of the code in action on a real messenger RNA. Is that correct? Well, it was sort of contemporaneous with Jerry Adams, who'd been a colleague of mine in the Watson lab, had gone on to be a postdoc in Fred Sanger's lab, and they had isolated a fragment. It was known at that time that if you treated an RNA molecule lightly with a nuclease, that you could get various size fragments because of some sort of structure, and they had pulled out one of these fragments and seen that uh, part of the coat protein sequence, uh, in fact, folded into a hairpin loop that okay. was protected. And so that information, plus the information I got from the AUGs and then the downstream sequences, were the first correlation between nucleic acid sequence and the, the proteins that were known to be coded by and, those sequences. And upstream in those ribosome binding sites yeah. is non-coding RNA, It was, right? was non-coding non RNA, yes. Right. yes. How long was the uh, fragment that was protected by the ribosomes? It's about 30 nucleotides long. So not too hard to sequence then yeah. by the Sanger yeah. method. Yeah. Okay. So you had but I had a mixture of three of them because I had ribosomes sitting at the beginnings of all three of the major of the genes. So, so you, that you, had to be sort of separated out. So you had brought R17 to Crick's lab, is that correct? Well, other, I think other people already had it, but I definitely brought it and used it because I knew how to grow it and stuff so like that. So that. Uh, that experimental plan was kind of floating around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But needed somebody to needed really Needed somebody it. who wanted to do it. Yeah. Who wasn't afraid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what happened to you next? You went to Yale, right? Yep. So then, you know, then the impossible happened. I mean, um, I'd succeeded in this project. Everybody was very excited about it. And all of a sudden, people were offering me jobs. And I was... <laughs> and it, in those days, when communication wasn't so good, you sort of didn't know that much about what was happening in a different country, particularly one separated by an ocean. And we'd been in Cambridge for three years and gotten sort of divorced from what was going on. Um, I think one really important thing was the women's movement in the US had gotten going. Um, now I'm forgetting the names of the people, Bella Apsug, and uh, there'd been various books written. There was a lot of pressure. Um, this actually happened a little bit later, but I think the tenor was in the air during the Nixon administration. So now we're talking the early 1970s. There was actually um, his uh, secretary of labor, a guy named George Schultz, actually ended up writing a letter to universities saying that if they didn't have plans to hire women faculty, they might lose their federal grants. 
And of course, everybody went, ah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, if you look at, you know, if you look at a plot of the number of women faculty over time, you'll see a big upsurge in the early 1970s, which I think can be ascribed to the women's movement on the one hand, and then this particular um, person uh, on the secondarily. And I, in fact, know some women who ac actually got their jobs because of those letters. So that's what I found out much, much, much later. So you had other offers besides Yale? Yeah. 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 And why did you go to Yale? Um, well, because it was a good pay place in crystallography. Um, it was a good place in molecular biology. And it was sort of the best place that we ended up so this considering. Is the, this is the early 70s now. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. And how soon after you arrived did Rich knock on your door? Within a couple of months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Because yeah. you must have gotten there the same time I did, the fall of 1970. Right, but we didn't get there until after Thanksgiving. You were there probably from September. I was there from, yeah, August, August September. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. What? Why yeah, but you, you started in May in the lab, uh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, we didn't do rotations or anything. Yeah. Right. So he just came, knocked on your door, said, I want to work. And yeah. Like, Why did yeah. you take him? <laughs> Look, I was so flabbergasted that anybody would want to work in my lab. Okay, so I want, I, you know, I got I to gotta tell this. Okay, uh-oh. <laughs> so I worked in a ribosome lab as an undergraduate, a mutual friend of ours, Harry Noller. Okay. Harry had brought back from the Cold Spring Harbor meeting in 1969 the Cold Spring Harbor volume and taught a seminar course in my senior year, okay, and that was the volume. It was, uh, it, it was, the seminar course was on the volume, which was on mechanisms of protein synthesis, and that's where Jones' ribosome binding paper was. And that paper blew my mind. It's the, you know, it blew my mind. I didn't even know Joan was going to be at Yale when I went to Yale. And I showed up, and there she was, and I said. <laughs> so, and I remember this. I was insistent. I went and I said, can I work in your lab? She said, what are you, crazy? I just got here. <laughs> and I said, I want to work in your lab. She says, why don't you go work with Dieter Sol or somebody, you know, who's got, a, who's got an established laboratory or something like that. I said, I want to work in your lab. She said, okay. We finally relented. <laughs> it was the best thing that ever happened. Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, I had to do this. So you had brought the R17 system back with you. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. And you continued this problem of initiation. Right? right, right. And what was involved in the initiation of protein synthesis and prokaryotes, that continued for very solidly for about 10 years in the lab. And during that time, you found the Shine Delgarno in the mRNA, yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah, I remember looking for sequence complementarity, or uh, actually sequence homology, among binding sites. Yeah. And uh, Paula, the technician, technician in the lab yeah, at the yeah, time, yeah. had uh, graph paper that was you know, just squares. It was a grid. And you'd write one sequence across here and one sequence across here so that it was a matrix where you could compare them and put in dots where the same nucleotides were looking for patterns. Yeah, That's how yeah. that was done. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the, it was so subtle, you couldn't yeah, find it. That uh, way. Well, what we did notice was that upstream of the initiator AUGs was a purine rich region. But it wasn't the same in sequence and the the orientation was always a little bit a little farther away or a little closer. And so it it wasn't immediately obvious. It was subtle. It was subtle. So uh, at some point you switched to vertebrate cells, right? What was the impetus for that? Okay. So, so now we're getting on towards 1980, okay. 1976, so, you took us about Exactly, it. okay, so at that, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> at that time, people had sort of relented about this feeling that people working on mammalian cells were crazy and wasting their time and more and more molecular biologists were beginning to do things in mammalian cells. Now, remember, introns were discovered in 1977. But what accumulated before that was, first of all, we knew there was way too much DNA. What was all this extra DNA doing? Uh, we knew that there was huge RNA wastage in 
eukaryotic cells. In other words, that lots and lots of RNA got made in the nucleus, most of it got degraded, and only a tiny fraction of it went out to the cytoplasm as messenger RNA. And you know, nobody knew what was going on. First poly A tails were discovered by, um, Mar was that Mary Edmonds? Or Gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting now. But first, poly A tails were discovered, and then everybody looked at the nuclear RNA versus the cytoplasmic message, and they both had poly A tails. And so then everybody thought, well, these molecules are just very, very long, and you chop them off. Who knows why you chop them off? And just take the three prime ends, and that's what becomes messages. Uh, but then caps were discovered. And People looked, and there were caps on messages, and there were also caps on this nuclear, very long RNA. And everybody was just, nobody could understand what happened. Um, it was just a total black box. And then the evidence emerged from Phil Sharp's lab at MIT and the lab at Cold Spring Harbor, who were doing our loop mapping to find out where the sequences in these adenovirus messages were coming from. And it was just sort of a an incredible uh, sort of windfall type situation that all of a sudden, you know, it made sense. And it was the visualizing it in the EM that I think really persuaded people that there were internal pieces being taken out of these big long precursors and those weren't then present in the final product. And you went to on sabbatical. Just to before Gurdian, that. Just before to that. Right, to right, work right. on SNRPs. No, 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 no. Um, so, so there was this. So there was this problem that I've just described. You know what the heck was going on in the difference between the nuclear RNA and the cytoplasmic RNA. And one thing that was known about nuclear RNA is the HNRMP proteins had already been discovered. So it was known that the minute the transcripts were made in the nucleus, they were coated with proteins. And I thought that maybe those proteins were important in deciding which pieces of the RNA eventually got out to be cytoplasmic messages. And even back then, it was known that if you had antibodies against something, you could use them as tools to try to figure out what those things were doing. So I spent my sabbatical trying to make antibodies against HNRNP proteins. Um, I failed because they're very conserved interspecies, and they're not very immunogenic. And it was only a decade later that Gideon Dreyfus got all the beautiful antibodies that he got. I admire him tremendously. And the way he did it was by UV cross-linking RNA to the RNA-binding proteins, the H and RNP proteins. And that you know, distorted them just enough so they became immunogenic. So I gave up on that project and did something else. And it wasn't until we came back that um, keep going, keep going, okay. because the, the, okay. this is great. Oh, this is a cool story. Okay, so so while I was trying to make these antibodies during the year, you know, and going around Europe giving talks and stuff like that, somebody said to me at one point that they thought they'd heard of patients that had autoantibodies against something in the nucleus that had RNA and protein in it. And maybe those were the antibodies I was trying to make. But at that point, I didn't know who to ask. And it was a year later when I came back to Yale. And I had a new MD-PhD student in my lab, Michael Lerner. And he'd just taken all his uh, medical school courses. And then a paper came out in Nature describing one of these kinds of antibodies. And I said to Michael, do you, do you know anybody here at Yale who would have patients? And he said, oh, sure. I'll go across the street and see Hardin. So literally, right across the street from where my lab was, was the rheumatology section of the Department of Internal Medicine. And he went across that, the street that very afternoon and came back with several you know, little vials of blood like they draw in the blood lab and started working with them. And of course, if you think about it, if that happened now, you'd have to spend <laughs> weeks, months, years filling out human investigation forms to even be able to use you know, two millimeter or two yeah, two milliliters of blood that you know somebody wanted wanted you to use 
Um, and it never would have gotten done, but it got done then because those rules were in place. And he started working with the antibodies to try to figure out what they were targeting. And they weren't targeting these big HNRP complexes. They were targeting something that was small, that was very highly conserved, very abundant. And we decided since you know, it had RNA in it, I liked RNA. It was worth working on uh, and trying to figure out what it was, and that is what turned out to be the splicing SNRPs. And so, what, and, and so then how was the connection made between the RNA component of that and splicing? Well, I mean, okay, so we'd worked on bacterial ribosomes using the 3' prime end of the 16 sRNA to base pair with the sequences upstream of the AUGs. So you look at the small nuclear RNAs and you look for sequences that are there in the introns that they might be complementary to. So that was pretty obvious. Okay, bingo. Yeah. Great. To when, Direct progression, when, RNA base pairs. <clears throat> when did you stop doing phage work? <sighs> Probably around that time. Yeah. And now everything is. And in there was a big, cells. there was a big contingent that worked on T7, and you yeah. were the pioneer there. Um, discovered lots of cool things about T7 and how it makes its proteins. That went on. It was. It was out and of. It continued on. It was out of your lab ultimately that the that the promoter uh, phage polymerase promoter sequence came. Is that right? I. I think so, but uh, Joe Coleman's lab was also involved okay. in that, and yeah, I don't remember. And you actually did do ribosome binding sites on some T7 on T7 messages, right? oh yeah, oh right. yeah, yeah. So th this entry into the small nuclear RNAs got you into uh, vertebrate mammalian cells, and then yeah. got you into non-coding yeah. RNAs of yeah. all yeah. sorts, yeah. which yeah. you continue to do yeah. to this day. And very early on, then we got back, we got into animal virology because um, Michael and his brother, who was also an MD-PhD student who was working in immunology, um, decided that they wanted to figure out what was Michael initially, decided that he wanted to figure out whether when you had virus-infected cells, whether there might be anything else in there mm -hmm. that these antigenic proteins that are the targets of the autoantibodies might bind to. And that was how he discovered the Ebers mm -hmm. in 1981. Is this Richard Lerner we're talking about? No, 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 Lerner. no, no relation. No Michael relation. Lerner. But his brother, you said, who's that? His brother is Ethan Lerner, Ethan, right. who's been in the de dermatology department at um, Harvard Medical School for okay. a number of years. So the, much of the work you told us about herpes viruses at yeah. this meeting stemmed yeah. from those early stemmed from, beginnings. Stemmed from way back then. And then, of course, when uh, microRNAs and RNAIs were uh, discovered, you, you started working on yeah, that as well. well. Of course. I mean, yeah, once yeah, once you start working on non-coding RNAs, they've just been an explosion. So, yeah. you know, there are lots of fantastic things that have come along. So, so, so of everything that you have done in your career, everything, oh, when you look back, it's a long career, wonderful stuff. Like, what, what's the one thing you would point to as, as contributing the most to science, I'd, I'd say? Oh. You can take a few minutes to answer that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Since I sprung it well, on you. I have a hard time distinguishing between ribosome binding sites and the RNA-RNA interactions there, and the SNRPs and the RNA-RNA binding interactions there. And once you sort of think about all RNA machines as having this potential for specific interactions with other RNAs via RNA-RNA-based pairing, then you know it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I've never, never deviated very far in my entire career from one theme. <laughs> Pretty simple. So, so if you were starting today in science, oh, right? what would I do? What would you do? Yeah. Oh, well, I keep telling people in my lab that they should become virologists because I think viruses <laughs> yeah. are so fantastic. There you go. Yeah. Because, I mean, vir viruses take these fabulous things that cells do and then tweak them further and make them do even more incredible things. So I just, I just think viruses are wonderful. And, you know, now they're, you know, they're really getting to be some therapies for viruses as a result of all the basic research 
that people have done. I think you're a virologist. You, you told me many times you're not, but isn't she a virologist? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Half my lab at this point does work on viral projects. Has there ever been a time when there wasn't a virus project going on? <sighs> Or starting I mean, with phage. I mean, yeah, you know. well, perhaps just there might not have been any phage projects for a year or two before uh -huh. we got into the SNRPs. Okay. So if you had not been a scientist, what would you have done? Probably would have been an MD. Ah, we would have gone to medical school. Yeah, yeah. And do you think you would be treating patients or doing research? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. If you could have dinner with one person, who would it be? <laughs> oh, gosh. Don't say Rich Condit. <laughs> she already did that, right? How long do I get? Five minutes, <laughs> ten minutes to well, think about yeah. this one? Thirty seconds. Oh, gosh. It's got, to, it's got to be one of those quick response things. Something's got to <sighs> pop into your head. Nothing pops into my head. You sure? Yep, I'm sure. All right, so we can... You can we go can, on to something more we, relevant. We can. <laughs> how, how about Tom? How about Tom? What about Tom? You would have dinner with Tom. My husband. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I do. Yes, and I enjoy it immensely. So you've been in science a long time. You've seen a lot of things change. What is the one thing that you have seen that is, you think has made the biggest impact on the field of all the things that have changed? And it could be, it could be a, yeah. anything. Well... I think that science, science, science and scientists getting more diverse has made a big impact, and I'm looking forward to it making even more of an impact. I mean, that has been a real change, because at the time I started, as I intimated, there were men scientists, and if you were a woman, you stuck out like a sore thumb, because you were different. And it was sort of not unfriendly, but it wasn't comfortable. And having lots of other types of people around, at least for me, it makes it much more comfortable and much more fun. And I'm... <laughs> you know, and there are studies that show that more diverse groups of people come up with more creative solutions to problems. And I do think that's true. So I like having, you know, lots of different kinds of people in my lab. How has the balance of uh, males and females in your lab, has it changed over the years? Um, not all that much. Um, it's, I'm embarrassed to say it's always been slightly more male than female, but, but pretty much 50-50. So there are lots of young, aspiring virologists, scientists out here. Do you have any advice for them, especially the women? <sighs> well. If you love doing science and you really want to do it, you'll figure out a way to do it. And don't let people discourage you and don't get, don't get questioning of your own abilities because there are some, there's always ups and downs, but things usually come up after they're down. So just, just keep at it and you'll end up doing something very exciting and something that you want to do. Yeah, your first, uh, your, from what I heard, your first project in Alex Rich's lab was a flop, yeah. right? Yeah, but I learned and, a lot. It was and your fun. And your HNRNP sabbatical was a flop, yep. right? Yeah, But you keep going. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I, I really thought it was over after that because <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do next. I didn't want to just stick with bacteria, but... So you haven't thought of who you want to go to dinner with, right? No. <laughs> I asked that question on a twiff of Britt Glausinger. Is she here? Okay, I can tell you what she said. What did she say? Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go to dinner with him, right? No. Not <laughs> okay. Should we do some picks of the week, guys? Yeah, I, I want to ask you a question first, yeah. because we haven't asked this. How many uh, people out there are TWIV listeners? OK, this is oh, wow. audio. You have to clap. <laughs> Good. Good. What, what did you say that is, 80%? Uh, no. it, was, it was over 50, for sure. People are kind of timid, you know. They don't do that. <laughs> it might have been an 80% clap, yeah. 
but that way they know what the important papers are. That's right, exactly. What do you think of this podcasting thing, Joan? I think it's a great idea. Yeah? Yeah. Have you, have you before this, have you ever hear of them or encountered them in any way? What, TWIP? Pod, podcasts in general. Podcasts in general. Oh, I don't do that many of them. Okay. But I did look at this. Yeah, we have a good time, right? Yeah, I know. And part of um, every episode of TWIV is we, we do picks of the week, and we pick something we think our listeners are going to enjoy. So um, let's start with you, Rich, because you have a cool pick here. Uh, this is real simple. I picked the uh, ribosome binding experiment, the R17 experiment. Okay. You heard all about it. I had not seen it. Uh, and actually, I wrote, uh, unfortunately, it's behind a paywall. We'll put the link in there. You can at least see the title and the abstract and get that stuff. But I also, last night, uh, wrote uh, Nature asking for permission to post the PDF or the link or something like that. We'll see how that goes. And, and uh, if we can get permission, uh, uh, you'll get the whole article. For those of you who have library access, it's, it's there. So it's, a, it's a Nature 1969 polypeptide chain initiation, nucleotide sequences of the three ribosome binding sites in bacteriophage R17 RNA. And the sole author is Joan Argetzinger Stites. How about that, right? Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Rich. When do you think nature will let you do that? Probably not. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic. And I, uh, I'll count on it. I mean, <laughs> Kathy, what do you have it. for us? Well, as some of you may know that we have sort of an art and science theme, and this was something, I can't remember how I ran across it, but the link is charityhall.com, and I'm not even sure what that whole website is. The first time I visited it, I found a number of science-related things, but the initial one that I found were, were these uh, pieces of jewelry that are insect enamels. Um, it's very straightforward. I think I gave you the more detailed link that goes right to the, to the enamels, but they're really beautiful. And uh, there are some other things on the site that I just like visual things. So this was a particularly easy one to tell you about. All right, my pick is something that's happening today. It's the NASA Pluto flyby. You know that's happening mm -hmm. right now. In mm -hmm. fact, mm -hmm. yeah, it's cool. I mean, these are our science colleagues. These are astronomers and space astrophysicists. And they, this, this uh, spacecraft was launched, what, in 1996, I think. Right? Mm -hmm. 10 and, years ago. And it has been moving. It just passed the, its closest point at Pluto, and the pictures are coming back, and you can already see some amazing previews of this. Well, I think it's a planet, right? <laughs> so, Vincent, it was launched in 2006. 2006. January 2006, and at the time, of course, Pluto was still a planet. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, it's interesting that the reclassification of Pluto was done by like 5% of all astronomers. And it's as if, it's as if uh, herpes viruses were reclassified by us in this room today, right? So right. it's a very small minority. Anyway, there's a page, solarsystem.nasa.gov, uh, where you can find links to everything that's going on. So I salute our fellow scientists. This is such a cool thing uh, that they're doing. Um, how many of you would like to go to another planet to find viruses? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, see? We could do something like this. So, Kathy, you had some follow-up to this, too. Well, just uh, yeah, following up on what you said, that um, only less than 5% of the world's astronomers voted for that. And so there's still a, a debate going on about should it be a planet or should it not. There was an article last uh, fall about it. Um, and so uh, it's still pretty interesting. Uh, we were having breakfast, and uh, Grant McFadden pointed out that there's about a four and a half hour delay, and the closest, um, my phone went off at breakfast of when the closest approach was. And um, so he, we should see some images four and a half hours later uh, from, it was almost eight o'clock this morning. So right about now. Right about now. Um, but I'm trying to see it on Twitter, and I haven't seen anything yet. But <laughs> uh, so I think it'll be really cool, and then it's just going to go on by. Forever and ever, yeah. right? Till, well, but there's some beautiful it? images already. That's uh, great. It's worth it's checking really out. really cool. So that's that's great. Uh, so that'll do it for Twiv three forty six. Unless Rich, you have anything else? Is your last chance with Joe? Uh, you know? No, this is pretty this, good. Yeah, this is good. This you is good. Uh, well, I know one thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that is that um, my experience in Joan's lab was transformational. It was great. Likewise. <laughs> All 
All right, that's TWIV 346. You can find it at twiv.tv. We're on iTunes. If you have a smartphone, Android, or iOS device, you can get a podcatcher that will pull down podcasts. You can subscribe for free. And we love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I want to thank everybody involved, the ASV Council. I want to thank our local hosts here at Western University, Yang Kang, Stephen Barr, Jimmy Dikiakos, who have been great helping us, all the local volunteers, you guys. Thank you so much. And of course, I want to thank our special guest, Joan Stites. I am completely honored to have you, not only as keynote, but here on TWIV. You're amazing, awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Kathy Spindler is from the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is really delightful. Rich Condit is at the university. No, you're not. Yeah, I am. I'm, a, freelance. I'm, I'm freelance, but I'm an emeritus professor, so I'll I still say? use that should, tag. Should I say you're at the University of Florida? In you Gainesville? can say that, yeah. All sure, right, Rich there. Condit's at the University of Florida in Gainesville. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Always a good time. And I'm Always Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>